The insert actually has on it um, a description of Greg Clark, who is a chair of, newly, a, a newly chair of economics at UC Davis, and also has had a, 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 a widely reviewed book, which is about to be reviewed also in the New York Review of Books, um, called A Farewell to Alms, A Brief History, A Brief Economic History of the World, and um, Greg Clark. Thank you. Um, world economic history is fortunately so simple that we can portray it on one picture. Uh, and I'm afraid, uh, contrary to, to uh, uh, some earlier speakers, all the way from 100,000 BC up until about 1800, there's absolutely no improvement in the human condition. Uh, and all of world economic history has in some sense occurred in the last 200 years. Um, and the reason for this is that there's something called a Malthusian trap, where because productivity, the efficiency of the economy expands very slowly, and we can actually measure that at the world scale, and we believe that between 1 AD and 1750, there was a 24% gain in the efficiency of the world economy. <laughs> uh, and because of that, you end up in this situation where living standards depend only on fertility and mortality conditions. And those don't change really between the hunter-gatherer era and 1800, except in the sense of getting worse. And so if anything, living standards are getting worse as we move towards 1800. And we can actually portray all of, the, all, we only need three assumptions to explain almost all world economic history, human economic history. There's income on these horizontal axes. There's going to be a birth rate that goes up with income, a death rate that declines with income. And then population will be inversely related to income because there's a fixed factor, land, that you can't expand in these societies. And you'll end up always at some equilibrium income, the subsistence income, which can actually be pretty high. It can be pretty good, but it's just that's the income at which population comes into balance with resources. And so, that's the world, and the, the problem is before 1800, as long as that income population relationship really doesn't change very fast, you're always driven back to this point. And this seems a, a kind of very counterintuitive claim. Here's a group of modern foragers from uh, southern Colombia uh, 15 years ago. Uh, here's post Enlightenment Britain uh, with uh, these very prosperous looking people. But the book claims that even though the English in this period were amongst the richest people in the world, they were no better off than hunter-gatherers. And that seems absurd, but there's always inequality in these societies. And so if we actually do a table and compare the two, you can actually calculate English calorie consumption in 1800, the average, and compare that with modern forager societies. It's the same. The English get less protein, and it's a much less varied diet. Hunter-gatherers, you never know what's going to be for dinner each day. Uh, you can look at heights of people as an indicator of consumption and also the amount of illness you're exposed to. And the English are about the same height as the average hunter-gatherer. And we can compare the English with Neolithic and Mesolithic skeletons in, in Europe. And the answer is, if anything, they're about the same height as well. Uh, if you look at work hours per day, the English labor at this intensely boring agricultural work, a quarter of the annual labor of, of agricultural workers, something like 800 hours, consists of beating grain with a stick. <laughs> right? That's a quarter of your lifetime. Right? Uh, they have to work much harder than these forager societies on average. And then if you look at life expectancy at birth, it's a little bit better in England than the median modern forager society. England is very high for 1800, though. If you actually get to age 20, you're better off in a forager society. So if you think of adult life expectancy as being more important than what's happening in the first year of people's lives, better off being in the hunter-gatherer world. And then reflecting this, you see that hunter-gatherer societies are actually amazingly productive in terms of how much calories they can produce per day. Right? And, so it's, it's, and this is England. England turns out to have living standards probably double those of Japan or China or India around about 1800. So we believe, on average, Things just went from relatively bad to worse, from 100,000 BC up till 1800, right? And you really are kind of caught in this world. And the puzzle, the incredible puzzle for economics is how we escaped that world of very slow technological advance. And most economists think of this in terms of institutions. Good question up here. 
Oh, that's like the future years. It's further years of life expectancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the puzzle for economists is that we rely on institutions to explain everything. We rely on this maintained assumption that everyone's the same everywhere, essentially. Just give people the right incentives, then things will change. Um, we can find societies a thousand years before the Industrial Revolution, which institutionally were more incentivized than modern America or modern Sweden. I mean, medieval England is actually one of these, where uh, Margaret Thatcher could have happily settled into medieval England and found a society to deeply approve of. Right? And so the, the puzzle then in the book is to, to, to think about what's the dynamic that gets us out of this world into the modern world, given that, that nothing really is changing. Right? And that also institutions are changing surprisingly little. And things like the Enlightenment are really not doing as much as you might think for the economic institutions of this society. And it turns out that the argument of the book is that you can actually very clearly see that the culture of human societies actually evolved in the period between the Neolithic Revolution and 1800. That there was, in recent times, very clear cultural evolution, and it may even be genetic changes that actually occurred within this time. That by 1800, we were very different in terms of our preferences from hunter-gatherers. That consequently, in the modern world, there may be groups of people with very different historical experiences who actually have fundamentally different preferences. And that those preference changes were what seemed to allow the advent of the modern world but the interesting thing is going to be is that people who, who, who made it through in this pre-industrial era and, and who came to dominate this world uh, are actually a selfish and unpleasant bunch. Um, and how is this going to operate? Well, in this Malthusian world where you have material income and your birth and death rates, what should happen in cross-section is those who command resources in any society should have more than two children surviving. Those who don't manage to get hold of resources should have less than two children. So the Malthusian world inherently has to be a Darwinian world also. And if that world persisted till 1800, then this basic Darwinism actually had to be applying in human society long after the kind of hunter-gatherer era. There was a modern era of selection. And what I actually do is uh, empirically to look at this, I'm an empirical economic historian, is to look at this source, which is the wills of male testators in England in this period, 1560 to 1680. And very large numbers of men left wills in this society. Those wills reveal both how much assets they had, how literate they were, and also how many surviving children they had. And as in this world, you expect, on average, the population is growing a little bit in this period, 2.2 surviving children per person is the average that this society is going to have. Uh, and by the way, these wills look like this. <laughs> but it turns out there were various and, and, uh, ways that I needed 3,000 of these to go through that we have to actually infer the information from. But fortunately, a lot of these have been transposed by incredible efforts of genealogists. What's the answer in pre-industrial England? The answer is survival of the richest. What you see here is that the richest men in the sample, who are not even the richest people in this society, this is kind of upper middle class, have four surviving children in this period. And even people who are leaving wills and have assets, who are relatively poorer, are disappearing from this society. This top group is doubling its share in the population in each generation in England. And I can show that that process is operating back at least to 1250. Right? And because there aren't a lot of positions available, there's only a certain amount of land, only a certain amount of merchant activity, a certain amount of law positions. What's actually happening in this society is a cascade of downward mobility. The, the people who survived to England in 1800 are the children largely of the successful economically of the Middle Ages. The rest of the society just disappeared. <laughs> there's a kind of, it's becoming bourgeois by biological mechanisms. <laughs> Right? And what I'll show you, I mean, th is that this society is culturally very different from the ancient world, and that there's actually potentially this biological source of this change. And what are, and you can also show with this data, I can get wills of fathers and sons, and you can actually show that it's transmitted from fathers to sons. Successful fathers have successful sons. There's a very tight correlation, a correlation of something like uh, 0.8 between 
the fathers and the sons in this period. And you could also show that it's not just the fact that they got the wealth. They share either culture or genes with the fathers that's making them successful. There's various experiments we could do that actually show that it really is transmission either of culture or potentially of genes. Um, we could also, in these wills, get some interesting de detail about this is a very religious society in this period, 1620 to 40. The period of religious fervent. These wills all begin with religious invocations, uh, noting the, the humbleness of the person, their place you know, before God. You can actually calculate what fraction of their money they left to the poor. <laughs> and it's very common to leave something to the poor. For the richest group in this society, it's less than half a percent of their assets actually go to charity. These people are selfish. <laughs> they leave stuff. And the poorest people are much more likely. A large fraction of their assets are going. The reason for that is they don't have anyone else to leave the money to. <laughs> They are, large, they are occurring, and, and what's happening is there are a lot of rich people who don't have children when they die, but they have nieces and nephews. And what these people behave like is as though they're trying to maximize the genetic success of, of their, you know, the success of their genes. They leave money to those who are related to them. Rich people have many servants in this society. They get almost nothing. Wives get very little because they're not genetically related to the husband, except as a way of getting it to the children. And there's a lot of concern in these wills that the wives are going to take your assets and breed with some other man. And sometimes it's even kind of said, you're not allowed to remarry. Or if you do remarry, all the assets have to be transferred to the children right away. And in some of these families, wives have been previously married. They have children from previous relationships. They get very little as well. And so these people really believe as though they, they, had, le they had read texts on sociobiology <laughs> in this society. And they leave very little, as I say, unless they don't have anyone who's related to them. Uh, and so what you're seeing in this society is that economic success is being translated into reproductive success. That's being transmitted down through generations. There's a general downward social mobility going on. There's a general, and if we believe that the rich are genetically different from the poor, that the things that make people rich in this fairly commercial society are actually, and, and if we think about modern America, we'd have to say you, you think that the rich would be genetically different from the poor, that there are certain attributes they have that are making them successful. You're actually going to see over these many, many generations changes in the genetic makeup of, of these societies. And this is happening in England, but there's evidence that it's also happening in places like China and Japan, but maybe unusually rapidly in England because of the, the, the structure of the society. Now, uh, the, so the envious have inherited the elf. Basically, the selfish, the nepotistically, and the blindly accumulative <laughs> represent the modern population. And one issue this has in terms of religious ethics is you know, there's just going to be an incredible disconnect in these societies between the precepts of a lot of religions and people's actual economic behavior. <laughs> Right? People's actual, and what the, you know, in a, in a book that's a history of the world, the question is, well, you know, a 420 page history of the world, what do you leave in and what do you not include? And, and religion plays surprisingly little role. And one of the reasons for that is that these societies show an amazing ability to adopt religious precepts, but behave in a completely different way. <laughs> and, and what people talk about in religious terms, if you look at their actual behavior and how they spend money, Religion doesn't matter in a lot of these societies and is quickly undercut in a lot of these societies. People here behave as though they're trying to maximize their genetic success. Now, uh, in contrast, we already had some reference to the Yanomamo. Uh, Napoleon Chagnon's study of the Yanomamo is, one, is the only study of reproductive success in hunter-gatherer society suggests that basically violence is a successful strategy. And what's interesting about England in this period is these people make their money not through violence. It's through commercial and other activities. And so this is a society where all of the, the, the stress is on economic success, and that is being translated into a change in the society. Now quickly, in the same period, we can actually see evidence of fundamental changes in human preferences. The first one, and this is just illustrative, uh, is what about interest rates? Uh, interest rates reflect our degree of impatience. The interest rate is a payment for waiting for consumption till sometime in the future. In the modern world, the risk-free interest rate is typically calculated at about 3%. And that's in a world, though, with taxation, where the net return from investing is often maybe only 2%. What is it in this pre-industrial world? If you take, we can go, in England, we can go all the way back to the Middle Ages and look at returns on holding farmland. That's just a form of interest rate. And also on, on things, rent charges. I won't even explain what those are. And 
what you actually see is that in medieval England, risk-free interest rates were 10%. These would be fantastic returns if they were offered in the modern world. This was a world which offered incredible possibilities of social mobility. Uh, and these were tax-free returns as well. Uh, if you could get that, I would run from the room <laughs> if you could offer me that kind of prospect for investment and immediately put all my money into it, if I could find it in the modern world. That was routine. It was routine in England. It was routine across Europe. If you go to earlier societies, I don't show, show it here, in ancient Babylonia, reported interest rates are something like 20 to 25% on house mortgages. It's just one big fact of world economic history since the arrival of settled agriculture has been a steady downward drift in these interest rates. And the book argues that the only explanation that's conceivable in this, well, given what we know about these societies for this, is that people fundamentally change their preferences and the way that they were behaving. That we can actually see in historical time that we became adapted <laughs> to capitalist economies, right? And, and one of the big ideas of the book here is kind of Marxian is it was culture that launched the Industrial Revolution, but culture, our culture itself, is a product of the economic system that we labored under for generations in this pre-industrial period, and that culture has adapted <laughs> to economy in this Malthusian interval, and that that was one of the big factors that's responsible for their, in our ability to escape this uh, world. Um, another thing that I mentioned was labor inputs per day. You can actually see in historical time again, work effort. We've become addicted to work. Since the Industrial Revolution, we are 15 times more stuff per person, even compared to someone like Britain. We have spent all of that increased income in the form of goods, and none of it in the form of greater leisure. And if you measure work correctly, we've chosen to continue to accumulate. And the amazing thing is we can't do anything with this money now. We've reached societies where accumulation is for further goods is pointless. I mean, how many square feet can the average American house contain? Studies of people in these houses have shown that they tend to move around like rats around the edges of these giant rooms, <laughs> seeking small spaces. Uh, and, and, and one of the things, the arguments of the book here is that, well, in some sense, we're, we've been bred towards this accumulative behavior because it was very productive in this pre-industrial world, but it's not necessarily productive now, right? And that, that the future is kind of foreseeable, that we will just continue to accumulate material goods, and, and that leisure, surprisingly, is a good that has very little value in the modern world. Uh, another thing is crime. We can actually measure the homicide rate in England back to the Middle Ages, and that was because of the king's financial interest in homicide. And again, you see in a pretty stable environment in England, quite substantial reductions in the basic violence that's going on within the society. This is not warfare. The warfare is, again, relatively limited in the case of England. But people are just becoming less violent over this period. And the argument is just in these institutionally stable societies, once property rights are all guaranteed, people who are violent are not reproducing in this society. There are heavy penalties, and it's not productive economically. The people who are, are doing well are those who are operating within the rules of the capitalist, uh, kind of quasi-capitalist system that you've created. And then the other thing we see is very substantial rises in basic literacy. If you go back to the ancient world, if you go back to the Romans, even the upper classes in ancient Rome were largely innumerate. We see that in the evidence from their tombstones, that in a society where life expectancy was probably 25 at birth, they are burying 120-year-olds, right? And, and no one seems to say, <laughs> This is absurd, right? Uh, and uh, you look at the, and also the, most of these, half of the upper classes, no one knew their age when they buried these people. When you get to England on the eve of the Industrial Revolution, even the, lower, the lowest classes, the people in the poor houses, have fairly good idea of their ages. We can actually measure this. And you see that there's this kind of steady upward drift. And a lot of this has been interpreted as a, a, just a pure cultural change, right? Resulting from things like religious innovations, Protestantism, the printing press, various other kind of exogenous stories. What the, the book argues is that there's a basic, another factor here, which is that the, the literate are actually taking over the society, <laughs> right? And that they are actually out reproducing the illiterate, and that there, there are other forces that are actually, that, and in some sense, it's quite plausible that religious changes, in part, are adapting to the change in the basic nature of the people in the society, right? That, that, that people's preferences are changing, religious beliefs are changing, it's not at all clear that the religion came first and then the preferences later. That there's, there's strong grounds for thinking that, that, that there are these basic preference changes. And so what's the implication for the modern world? 
one puzzle, worrying thing is that if there is a genetic component to this, then not all societies may have the same potential for economic growth. Right? It's not saying that this is a, these are, that social Darwinism, that these are better set of traits that are around. It's just a tra set of traits that will produce great amounts of output per person. Uh, 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 there have been some appeals in the discussions here to, well, what is our basic moral nature? What is our observed moral nature? Well, this says even within historical time, our, our observed nature may have changed quite significantly, and there's no reason necessarily to privilege the, the nature that we ended up with as a result, after all, of the operations of commercial, commerce and, and property rights. Uh, and it's kind of bizarre thought that we may be who we are because of the system of property rights that our ancestors lived under. Um, uh, and the other thing that we observe, what people do economically tends to be very poorly predicted by their formal religious beliefs. And so if you just look at people's actual behavior, you would say we've now ended up in a world where there's no evidence that further income gains by high income societies will have any effect on happiness. We know from studies of happiness that that's the case. That means that we could, if we agreed, we could transfer a lot of resources to very poor societies at essentially no cost to the rich societies. It's, uh, it, it, happiness is all about your relative position, it seems, rather than your absolute position. Do we do that? No. Are we ever likely to do that? No. And the argument is that you know, whatever our formal religious beliefs may be, we have a very strong basic underlying nature emerging from this pre-industrial world which says, hold on to what's yours pass it on to those who are related to you, and that that's your basic uh, instinct that, that has developed, as I say, under, within historical time. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so let's shift to another economist at this point, Deirdre McCloskey. Um, You, you actually want to want a question in the interim? See, sure, uh, please uh, do. Uh, go ahead. Uh, no, I don't have a pocket. Can, is there any way oh. it here? I'll, 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 I'll. Yeah, your metric is end of life. What about uh, religious tithing during life? There must be measures of that and who gave the most and that sort of thing. And, and that surely had a role. Uh, um, uh, is, that, is this working? Yep. Um, there's actually, uh, in this period, uh, t tithing is a, is a tax that people try and avoid to the maximum extent possible. But the tithe by this period in England, a lot of it has come into secular hands. It's not actually going to the church. It's actually it's fallen to other people. And so it's just regarded as, as another tax uh, equivalent to all these other things. The voluntary donations towards religious activities in this period are relatively small. Yeah. In earlier periods, in the late Middle Ages, people in their wills leave significant amounts to the church. But they seem to do this as a kind of a medicine for the soul, right? That it's an investment. They, they don't leave very much to the poor. They give for their prayers for their soul, not for prayers for anyone else's soul in this society. You make it sound like the most successful people uh, are knaves, but isn't it more likely that they're uh, solid citizens who achieve their wealth by having good reputations? Oh, no, no, I, I'm not saying that they, these were, were people who engaged in commerce and agriculture. They're absolutely respectable, there right? You go. And, and, like but what so I'm we're saying, not selecting for selfishness in the sort right. of simplistic sense. Right. So it's selfishness in the sense that they're worried about their welfare and the welfare of those genetically connected to them. They, they have very little interest in the welfare of the wider society. And, and, and the, those who did have a greater interest would disadvantage themselves in this competition in this society. Do you have do you have any evidence whatsoever that your first proposition in your conclusion that there may be genetic differences leading to differential economic growth uh, is true? So let me just give you one counterexample. If you take Muslims in Europe, they are 20 times more likely to be poor than Muslims in America. Now you might say that's self-selection. However, then if you take the poor Muslims from Europe and you bring them to the America Suddenly within a generation, better. they rise to exactly the same rate. Ekhtar. Uh, so, the, the, the question is, is there any evidence that that's not true universally? Um, the, the, what I'm thinking of more here is uh, it, there are very, I, I don't know of any society which has gone from being hunter-gatherer into a modern capitalist economy which has had s a significant economic success. All of those societies have had dramatic uh, problems, uh, in, in, including, you know, for example, the Australian aboriginals. 
who live in an institutional framework, which is again, it's ranked as one of the freest economies in the world, but who have terrible social and, and economic problems. And so, but it's absolutely the case that this is just a possibility. I don't think there have been any studies that say there's any systematic genetic uh, differences. But if you would grant me that, that if, uh, unless you believe that successful people in our society and people who don't have success are just genetically identical, that it's all a matter of you know, luck of parenting, social connections, these other things, then you're going to have to say, well, there are differences between these two groups. And then you're going to have to say, well, what's going on in pre-industrial England is going to change the ratio of those groups within the population. And so even though we don't obse observe it directly, if you think that, that your success is in any way due to, the, to your genes, <laughs> uh, then you're likely to believe that we will eventually <laughs> find differences. And then given the different histories of these societies, it's quite plausible that there will actually be uh, systematic uh, differences, right? But I, but I am absolutely willing to say that in modern societies, there are many other factors that contribute to economic success and economic failure. This is just saying that, well, here's one interesting kind of underlying factor that, that may help to play a role. And, and one last point, if we're trying to explain the, the world now economically seems to be returning somewhat to the configuration of its early history, say in 1500, in terms of which are the developed areas. It's basically Europe and European offshoots, Asia, India. Uh, in some sense, th there, there seems to be this possibility that the long history of these societies is actually playing a role in terms of their, their economic success at present. But these are all, these are all speculations, hypotheses, but interesting ones to think about nevertheless.